Thank you very much. And uh, it's so good to be amongst people again. <laughs> hey! Um, so uh, I must admit, having presented to a screen for the last two years, uh, do just, you know, if it's a happy nod or a fr angry frown, it's fine. Just demote at me. It's, it's making a nice change. Um, so uh, really, I think it's interesting just reflecting on um, last talk from Nick. I mean, I love the way that Nick talks about mental health and mental well-being. There's some really good themes there that... Um, uh, I think we'll all be speaking to it really about how we want to really join things up that much more. And I think what I'm going to share today is more of an uh, aspiration, a journey that we all going to need to go on together. I mean, health used to be nice and simple. You got ill, you went to a doctor, they gave you a pill, maybe you went to hospital and hopefully got better. Wasn't that nice and easy? And unfortunately, we now live in an age where <clears throat> our behaviors, our lifestyles have a massive impact on us. And in fact, it's, it's complicated. It's a lot more complicated. Where do we focus first? What matters most? Um, I mean, the diet industry um, has uh, done very well on fads because it tells you something is simple when it's not. I can't remember the person whose quote it is, but for every complex problem, there's a simple answer and it's usually wrong. So we have somehow, as individuals, got to manage this complexity. So pity the poor well-being manager who then has hundreds or thousands of people, each individual full of potential data points. How are we going to manage that? How are we going to develop well-being strategies that are going to be able to deliver for them? And uh, if anyone says they've solved it, they're lying. <laughs> this is a journey we're going to have to take together. So we do have an emerging data set. But there is a huge difference between data and knowledge. And what's particularly striking for me is just the number of people who are now actively trying to pull in the data, use the data, uh, even expanding the number of analysts they have available. But in terms of really knowing exactly what to do, setting KPIs, etc., that's still a, a bit of a challenge. And yet we understand the value of well-being and the fact that these 38% of businesses are now wanting to report on it in their annual reports. It shows that shareholders are interested in this too. At the end of the day, you know, the, I'm sure you've heard the maxim, that happy employees make happy customers. I absolutely believe that. And very direct. I mean, we can all imagine how someone on, on the end of a phone is going to engage with a customer. But um, it affects our creativity. It affects our problem solving, uh, the energy we bring to work. So this is a big challenge. A challenge that, as an employer, I think is very hard to take on. I mean, simple fact of GDPR, having your employees' health data is a very difficult place to be. So I think this really is going to be a challenge of how do employers work with providers? How do we actually um, make all this data easy and accessible? Um, I just love this quote about 0.5% of data is analyzed, and that number is shrinking. <laughs> Uh, do you have a data lake or do you have a data landfill? Um, what we're going to have to do, I think there is a, a, a tremendous um, resource out there. Uh, it's called scientific literature. People have done lots of studies. They've actually condensed a lot of this data to give some key insights. So for me, starting with at least a hypothesis of what we're going to try and do and see where is the evidence that supports that? And uh, then go doing it and learn by doing. But we still need to find a way to make all this complex stuff simple, and then we need to be able to do that at scale. So I was going to take out four sort of ideas to try and underpin, in, in some really simple aspiration, we've got to make that employee journey simple so that they can know how to navigate their own health and well-being that's going to work for them and critically achieve better health outcomes. So let's kick off with um, from utilization to outcomes. 
knowing how much a service is used is of little use if it doesn't actually do any good. So 96% of companies have an EAP from the recent um, Weaver report, which is great. Um, in the recent Mindhouse study we did, only 40% of people actually say they feel they've got good mental health support. From the Deloitte work, they've got a utilization figure of 10% on the EAP. But once again, from our Mind Health study work, over half of the UK are struggling or languishing. 20% of employees, 24% of managers, and we'll come back to that, are facing mental health challenges. So whichever way you cut it, those numbers are not adding up. There's clearly a gap between consumption and, and need. <clears throat> the implication of that is, are we actually addressing what the needs are, and uh, are we achieving outcomes? So I put up here just a few thoughts, really, about what are the kind of outcomes we potentially could be looking for. I've had the privilege uh, in uh, pre-pandemic years to stand up here with um, three companies over three years talking about what they have done to actually demonstrate improved health outcomes for their people. For me, if we look at any population, 95% um, of people will have some kind of health risk. And on average, they have about four to five health risks. So a simple start is to say, what is the health risk profile of our population? And can we actively manage that down? And there's plenty of uh, scientific work that attaches a, um, an impact on whether it's presenteeism, absenteeism, from that risk profile. So no, <clears throat> this is the classic. This is the new model. We don't have to wait for someone to be ill to do something. We can do something long before that. A whole idea of the well-being continuum that is not just about fixing the negative, but being proactive and trying to be people, help people be the best they can be. Core score. Core score is a sort of broad um, uh, mental health and well-being score. Um, and you can track improvement before and after. Weight, BMI, blood pressure. There's plenty of physical biometrics out there that we can take. I mean, to be honest, looking at the risk profile of any uh, organization, um, if it's white collar, it generally leads with psychological risk followed by weight followed by blood pressure. And if it's a blue collar organization, you literally just the top, switch the top two. They're generally quite consistent issues. There are plenty of stress scores. The work Edinburgh mental wellbeing score is a good one, if you want to look that up. <clears throat> um, we use health age. The reason we use health age is because um, actually talking directly to people about the number of health risks they have and their percentage chance of heart attack is somewhat demoralizing for some reason. Whereas if I can say, look, you may be 45, but your health age is 52, at an intuitive level that engages people with uh, in action. And more importantly, we can say, okay, and if you take this action, take that action, you could be two, three, four, five years younger. So trying to translate more technical language of risk into something more accessible, such as health age, we found works fantastically well. Um, We've also been digging further into mental health, trying to understand not just so mental illness and the scores around mental illness, but broader, what does good look like? Um, and this is something we've been building on um, in our uh, global study, which will be expanding next year. Trying to understand uh, what are the skills, attitudes, beliefs of people who flourish and how can we nurture and support those? DAS, depression and uh, anxiety and stress score. One's good, quite good for a general population. Uh, we use that um, in our health age and in uh, the Mind Health Index. GAD PHQ, more specialized for anxiety, depression, and uh, cholesterol snuck in there at the end. I, I have a soft spot for cholesterol, but it's quite a good way to track people's diet quality. Now, where we've come from in terms of um, the various services provided, generally we've had small companies doing a specific thing. And 
I think to be really transparent, we've sort of inherited, this is the, where we were two years ago, sort of the legacy of um, uh, Axa Health, which I fondly call the sp spaghetti and meatball uh, picture. You've got on the outside of where the people enter um, the various um, services. And uh, clearly, growing by acquisition and such, like you can end up with this situation. That's within one business. Now, imagine if you've got multiple providers all doing these things. How do we join that all up together? Especially when, so looking at the Reba report, there's a real desire to join things up, having consistent employee experiences and pathways that where you're identifying need in one conversation here, you can connect it to a solution over here. So for me, this is one of the big changes. Um, once again, though, we've got to be careful that if someone comes up and says, yes, I've joined everything up, but have I joined up things that actually work? So once we need to dig into what is the value of the individual services, can they deliver? So simplifying things, and this is the journey that we're on, is by simply being have one access point that then goes into multiple services, whether they're internal or actually partner services, just trying to make things a bit simpler uh, and accessible to people. Also, digitizing components, which, to be honest, I think it's almost surprising that uh, uh, people at the top, so physio, we know physio is a very phys physical thing. Um, and yet, being able to help people to access these kinds of services digitally, we found has actually really landed quite well, making it easier uh, for individuals achieving sort of NPSs over 50. Also, we've got to make sure we don't give people journeys with dead ends. So lots of people do health assessments, which is great. Awareness is a, is an crit a critical step. But if we don't then offer solutions to simply tell someone they've got high blood pressure or they're overweight, and stopping there is of very little value because believe me, people, some people will just say, right, fine, and fix themselves. A lot of people won't. They, they need more support. They need actionable solutions. So adding a sequence through to have consultation, finding what people's needs are, flowing through to health coaching. Once again, joining everything up so that you actually do get an outcome. Also, something we've inherited more from the, the industrial era, which we can change now in the digital era, is moving from sort of standardized services to something that we can get to the personal level. And thinking about the complexity of that individual well-being journey. Um, we are dealing with a hugely multi-dimensional problem here in terms of all the different things we need to take into account. And I don't think anyone has everything... Um, and I, to be honest, I don't think any employer can afford everything. So we're going to have to be a lot smarter about how we target solutions. Okay, so the challenge here is how do we simplify that complexity? How do we make a wide range of solutions that can be targeted <clears throat> at their price and affordable level for em employers? I think for me, the starting place is we talked a lot about proactivity uh, before it's giving people the, the, the tools to enable their personal responsibility to take charge of their own well-being. It's one thing to say people have responsibility, quite another to say they have responsibility, but yet give them what they need to get the job done. Be it skills, be it knowledge, uh, be it insight into their own biometrics and where their status is today. Within the process of personalizing things, we also really need to understand the needs of the line manager. They are critical to the organization, and they are a gateway to the well-being of their teams. How we support line managers in terms of being uh, champions of well-being, but also protecting them. One of the numbers that really concerned me from our, from our recent study was that uh, they're 20% more likely to have a mental health issue than the general population. So they are, in some ways, quite a vulnerable group, you'd almost say, within your organization, but also critical to deliver strategy. Now, technology 
clearly is a huge opportunity to manage all this in two ways. One, simplify things for the individual. Make sure they're seeing what they need to see because well-being is broad, it is diverse. We can basically focus down in what's relevant to them. But also in all those data sets from all those different sources, we've got to turn that data into insight. So finally, let's talk about value. I think what's really good about the way that I've seen well-being sort of develop over um, quite a few years now, and <clears throat> I used to always have to go in with an ROI model. Yep. And I'm not sure if anyone ever really believed it. <laughs> Um, and it's fascinating to see how the conversation has changed. Now, the fact is, in terms of the numbers, there's plenty of data around the value of well-being. So you've got Alex Edmonds' work saying, any in a company with good health and well-being um, solutions in place, they're growing two to three percent faster um, than their comparable um, uh, businesses. And if you that's sort of looking from the top down. Want to go from the bottom up, look at individual performance, the impact of well-being on individuals, risk reduction, etc. You're talking about a value of 1 to 5.8. Now, although a cautionary note, just because well-being creates value does not mean all well-being services are proven to deliver, deliver value. And that's where we get back to the point about outcomes. We've got to make sure these things really deliver. Because at the heart of it, if we can deliver to our people, then we get the benefits which actually I'm delighted to say are the ones that people are really after. Not so much the financial ones, but that culture benefit, the growth, the purpose. For me, that's what energizes a business, makes things happen. And uh, we can absolutely prove it. The data is there to actually turn an individual company's program into an individual assessment of um, value and outcome. But I would hope really most businesses now do this and are happy actually with a net net cost value because there's so much hidden value coming from well-being and that's something I think that people have basically sort of bought into collectively. <clears throat> and I have managed to finish time for questions, which is great, because I love questions. <laughs> but, uh, there's plenty of the reports to, uh, uh, that we provided the, uh, st at the stand, so do come and uh, talk to the team and uh, grab some of the, uh, uh, the insight in the literature.